The Devil's Diet, Your Driving. Well, and mine, come to think of it. When we drive our vehicles, a, a strange phenomenon takes place quite often. We are prone, are we not, if we are not careful, and we're not exercising self-control as Christians, we are liable to get very angry very quickly with other drivers. Maybe we become a little bit verbal towards another driver. Maybe we can display an action against another driver. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Does that sound familiar to you? It's as if when people who otherwise would be relatively placid, easygoing, patient, it's as if those sort of people, when they get behind the wheel of a car, suddenly fall for the, I don't know, the temptation, suddenly feel that they're in a position of invulnerability, uh, which will enable them to sound off against another driver who's driving doesn't come up to the standard of the, of the original first person driving. Uh, I'm sure you know what I mean. As we drive our vehicles, we see all sorts of behaviour, both in terms of the manner of driving and also the reaction of certain people to the driving of other people. So the devil's, di the devil's diet, your driving, the devil will feed on your driving. He won't feed on your driving if you are driving well, and I'm not talking about driving per se, just whether you would pass a driving test or not, but I'm talking about when you are driving, how you react, how we all react, how I react to other drivers driving. And the devil feeds on your attitude towards other drivers, if that attitude is wrong. The devil feeds on your behaviour towards other drivers, if that behaviour is wrong. The devil feeds on your words which you speak or probably shout towards other drivers, if those words are not the right sort of words. And the devil feeds on your actions towards other drivers, if your actions are not what they should be as Christians. And we don't want the devil to feed on any part of our character, on anything we say or do. We, we don't want to give him a diet. But so often, part of the devil's diet is your driving, because we react instantaneously, very quickly. We, we lose self-control. It is abandoned. It is as if, it's as if self-control never existed sometimes when we're behind the wheel of a car or indeed uh, riding a motorcycle, scooter, a two-wheeled vehicle. However many wheels the vehicle has got, often we can succumb to this loss of self-control. We can allow anger to suddenly rise up. And that's not right. As Christians, we give the devil something on which he can then feed. Some scriptures. I sat down just earlier today and I've written out here several scriptures and I'm going to go through them relatively quickly. The first one is in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 9. Do not hasten in your spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 9. So don't hasten, don't become angry very quickly because anger rests in the bosom of fools. You're a fool if you do that. That's what God says in his word. That's what scripture says. Anger rests in the bosom of fools. And it's not a righteous anger that we would feel, is it? Well, maybe some, I don't know. It's not to do with any theology. It's not to do with anybody's attitude, anybody else's attitude towards our God, 
it's just aggressive driving which they display cheeky driving <laughs> trying to overtake when they've got no place there to overtake and we, we suddenly get angry and well foolish foolish another scripture is from proverbs chapter 29 verse 22 it says an angry man stirs up strife and a furious man abounds in transgression now let's consider this you are driving your car or you're riding your motorbike and another driver or rider displays behavior in terms of his or her driving which is just totally wrong and you suddenly become angry what happens you give an entrance to the devil to start his feeding and you respond you react by saying something shouting something maybe you make a physical gesture with your hand or your arm that gives the other person then the potential to respond to react back to what you have done and this is road rage is it not we call it that in the uk road rage and i've seen it thankfully rarely but when motorists get into a physical confrontation the cars have stopped one or both drivers has got out of the driver's seat and violence ensues strife is stirred up and a furious man it says here this is still proverbs chapter 29 verse 22 a furious man abounds in transgression when we become furious angry particularly when it just suddenly happens we lose self-control reason is jettisoned it goes out of the window and in those moments we can be guilty of more than just anger we can be guilty of other sinful behavior as well other transgression we can abound in transgression when we become furious and often people become furious very angry when driving hence the title of this video message the devil's diet you're driving continuing with scriptures which i've written down here again from uh, proverbs this time it's chapter 17 of proverbs verse 28 even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace when he shuts his lips he is considered perceptive again when there is another driver whose driving is terrible awful and it oh we suddenly want to get oh, like that well it's best to hold our peace it's best to zip the lips because even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace so don't be foolish be a wise person and this is our god who is saying this to us this is not some philosophy from an eminent philosopher although we might say that our god he is the most eminent philosopher he is the most eminent everything <laughs> and he has written a book about this in fact he's written 66 books about how we should behave as people and specifically as christians so don't be a fool when you are the victim yes and i accept that we are often the victim of somebody else's aggressive driving bad driving don't be a fool be wise even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace when he shuts his lips he is considered perceptive again in proverbs this time proverbs chapter 25 verse 28 whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls proverbs chapter 25 verse 28 whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls cities used to have as part of their 
defensive arrangement, they used to have a wall around them. We read quite a lot about that, don't we, in, in the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, and even the city of Jerusalem, these days we can go there and see parts of the city wall. Other places and towns here in the UK have the remnants of a, of a wall around them to defend themselves. Without that wall to defend themselves, the, the city can become broken. It can become... It can be, it can become open house to bandits and robbers and thieves, wild animals, entry by people or animals which the walls are designed to repel, to stop coming in. So whoever has no rule over his spirit is like a city broken down without walls, defenceless. And in that moment of anger, that moment of... <clears throat> Somebody somebody cuts in front of us in a car or in a in a on a motorbike, even on a pedal cycle. Well, we don't want to be like a a, a broken down city without walls. We must rule over our own spirit. We must exercise this self control. Otherwise, we can become vulnerable to the devil feeding on our lack of self-control and our anger. Now, two scriptures with which to finish in terms of reading scripture, we have here in Colossians. And I'm going to read here from the letter to the Colossians, uh, chapter 4, no, chapter 3, I beg your pardon. Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. Colossians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them, but now... You yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, out of your mouth. Verses 1 to 8 of Colossians chapter 3. Some very unattractive, unappealing and destructive traits of human character there referred to, in which it says, we used to walk. Verse 7, in which you, you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now, as Christians, now we're born again. We, we're to put off anger, wrath, anger and wrath, <coughs> malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. And we know sometimes we've heard people ranting and using all sorts of language when driving. We've, maybe we've been a passenger in a car when the driver has been the victim of somebody else's terrible driving and the words come out. As Christians, we don't do that. We are told not to do that. Then James, the letter to James, turning over several pages here in my scriptures. James chapter 1. I'm going to read from verse 12 through to verse 20. The letter to James, chapter 1, verse 12 through to verse 20. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, 
when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Such wonderful advice there. Instruction. Verses 19, really, and 20 are those on which I want to concentrate just for a few seconds. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, but slow to speak and slow to wrath. And that includes your driving. Because when we're driving, and if we are very quick to get angry and very quick to maybe speak or shout, well, that's acting, speaking, contrary to what it says there in verse 19 of chapter 1 of James. Because, in verse 20, well, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, we are positionally, our position in Christ is that we are righteous, but we are still to practice righteousness, to display righteousness. And when we get angry, when we this wrath suddenly rises up inside us, we have a rush of blood, as the expression goes. Well, what is produced? It's the wrath of man, not the righteousness of God. And in that split second, in those seconds when we act or say something, things unrighteously, well, the character of God is just laid aside. And that's terrible. And we need to repent of that, to say sorry to our Lord and to mean it and to determine that for the future we will exercise self-control. Because for Christians, self-control is not just a good idea. It is not just best practice, but it's a duty. Because as Christians, we have a duty to obey God. It's more than a duty. We should have a desire to obey God. I'm sure we do. But this is a big subject and I'm not really doing it justice completely in this 15, 20 minute video message. But as I say, for Christians, self-control, it is a good idea. Well, it's more than that. It is best practice. It's much more than that. It's a duty which we should want to fulfil with enjoyment. Because when we fulfil whatever role it is, however we understand that we are meant to live our lives as born-again Christians, we want to please our Father in heaven, the Lord Jesus, and the Spirit of God. We want to please our three-personed God. So we should want to do what the Scriptures tell us to do. So to end up with this, this part one, I'm, I'm entitling this The Devil's Diet, Your Driving, Part One, and part two will follow from a slightly different, well, from a different angle, well, whenever I get round to doing it. But to f coming to the conclusion of this message, part one of your driving, let me suggest a couple of things. As you get into your car, or as you get on your pedal cycle as you get onto your motorbike pray before you turn the key or press the button however the ignition starts pray that on your journey the Lord will help you to exercise self-control because our roads I guess throughout the world and I know in many parts of the world the roads are far more dangerous than they are here in the UK but they're they're bad enough here it's a dangerous place to be it can be a hectic place to be and we will encounter people who cut us up who want to get in front of us well just let them do so let them do so 
I remember when I became a Christian many years ago, I was working in London. I wasn't living in London. I was living in town of Ipswich, but I was commuting to London several days a week. And whilst I was working in London, I became born again. Now, London, well, driving in London is certainly was then more of a racetrack than it is now because there are, the speed limits now are such that it, in most places the speed limit has been reduced. But in those days, the speed limit was a little bit higher and it was a racetrack. I became a born again Christian when I was in London and I noticed my attitude changed. It did. And driving along, I would let people out of a side road into the main road on which I was driving. I would let people come out, even if I hadn't indicated that they could come out. They would still come out because that's London driving. And that's driving that people exhibit all over the world. And you know what I found? I noticed that very soon after they'd come in front of me, they turned off. They turned off my road onto or into another road. So I hadn't lost anything anyway. Wonderful. And that understanding, that, well, attitude had been given to me, I believe, by the Lord God. Now, I'm not saying that I've got all this worked out. I'm not saying any more than that. I'm not saying I'm the best driver. I've got the best attitude at all times. No, I'm not. I'm in the same category as everybody else. But let somebody get in front of you. Let somebody cut you up. Because in the great scheme of things, as the expression goes, or to use another expression which I don't really like, life's too short, does it really matter if you lose a few seconds in, in your travel time? No, it doesn't matter in the great scheme of things. So as you get into your car, as you get onto your cycle or motorbike, pray that the Lord will enable you to chill, chill out on your journey and make a decision as you get in your car, get on your motorbike cycle, make a decision that you, with God's help, will exercise self-control. I haven't majored on self-control. There are scriptures dealing with self-control, but I want to keep this video message relatively short and I can see already that it's gone a bit longer than I otherwise would have liked. But, oh, there's so much to say about this.